Well, good morning. Welcome to Living Hope Bible Church. Good to have you with us this morning. Supposed to be another nice day today. It was a beautiful day yesterday. You thought so? I, I think so. Anyway, glad to have you with us to worship this morning. Would you stand? Rich is just about ready. He's up here with the praise team. So we're going to sing some praises to the Lord this morning. As soon as Rich gets adjusted over there. He's ready now. Well, pretty much. Almost. Whenever you're ready, Rich, take it away. <laughs> oh, he's, he, yeah, he's going <laughs> to. Okay. <laughs> Let's sing.
so much for all that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, and Lord, we thank you that you sent Jesus. He died on that cross for us to cover our sins, Lord, and because of that, we have the awesome opportunity of spending eternity in heaven with you. So, Lord, come fill this place with your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, and let us be changed because we've been in your presence this morning. Bless each and every one that's gathered here this morning, and those that couldn't make it, just watch over them, give them a special touch, let them know we're thinking of them this morning, Lord. Bless this entire service to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, good morning, church. Glad to be with you this morning. And uh, take a moment of time for some of our prayer concerns. We have our uh, list in your bulletin that's, that's been expressed there, and uh, we'll put it up to an opportunity to add some. Uh, Pastor Mark and Leanne are, are traveling. Um, today they were, Pastor Mark had a, a wedding, a family wedding yesterday up in Independence, I believe it was, so they uh, elected to stay up there for the weekend and have some time together. So I'm going to fill the pulpit, try to do uh, our message just as t today as, as best I can, but um, what about additional prayers? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Dave's got an aortic aneurysm, and the Lord's going to fix that through some surgery this week. So we'll lift you up. Amen. Glad he's got you in his life. I know many of us, I'm sure, if I am struggling with allergies right now. This week is kicking my butt, or should maybe say kicking my head. But, um, and if you're like me, it seems like it's getting worse as I age for some reason. It knows it so much as a child. But, uh, and anytime you get a spring with weather like this where it's up and down and up and down, it seems like it prolongs it because things will bloom and then they'll fade back and they'll bloom again, and whether it's grass or trees or whatever. You know, I've been cleaning a lot of fence rows, and we're doing some bulldozers, so I'm right down in it all week, which is completely a mistake, but um, bear, with, bear with me today. I have about 25% of my mental capacity. It's slow right now, right? So, what else? Yep, sorry. So that was Jason's brother-in-law, right? I blame him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, 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 <laughs> that's the connection. So no, a prayer call went out a week ago. Actually, it was last Friday or Saturday that it come. So at least, praise God, we, we have a prognosis there and, uh, on some healing there. So, so pray for the hospitals. Any other 
words this morning. I know there's many unspoken, I'm sure, either within your own hard life or others that you've interacted with. Many unknowns as well as unspoken, right? Okay, we'll uh, add on to this list here. As usual, when you exit uh, service today, there'll be a, a list of those if you desire to take them and pray for them. Let's uh, join me in prayer uh, as we lift up uh, those folks in need on our list and in the community and around us. So. Holy Father, Lord, we uh, thank you as always for the opportunity to come to you with our cares and with our burdens, and we cast them on you. Uh, one thing you've taught us is to, to leave our burdens and concerns at your feet, knowing that uh, you're there to, to pick them up. Uh, you care so much for us. You don't desire for us to, to go through pains and difficulties, but we know that's uh, one of the things that, that comes with uh, being in the world, um, whether it's uh, our, our own uh, repercussions or actions and other choices uh, that people take um, that's there, and aging happens as well. So Lord, I just pray today for those on our list, those that uh, one are, are traveling or are away, those that are in law enforcement defending uh, our freedoms and, and defending our country. We uh, pray for those uh, as well who are either going through uh, difficulties today, whether it's physical, uh, emotional, spiritual, mental. Um, I just ask that you draw close to them. We have many who are struggling with, with health concerns. We want to lift Dave up to you and Charlie at home. Uh, I think the Haas settlers uh, as well and uh, others that uh, got have some scheduled uh, procedures and, and uh, things going on in their life and just lift them uh, up to you at this time. We pray for others who may be struggling with losses. We think of the Franklin family uh, from here in town, Lord, that uh, we laid Nancy to rest this past week and just be with them and the boy that uh, would be there in this community today. So we just ask that uh, you just uh, dwell in, in the body of your church here uh, today and enrich uh, our bodies, your, your living temple to be a great, powerful uh, witness for you uh, each and every day. So I lift these needs and others to you that uh, lie within the recesses of our heart or those that may, we may even be having a blind eye or a blind ear to. God, help us to, to see them and respond in need, just as you would. Pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Uh, this time, we'll, uh, if you'd like to place any tithes or offerings in the box in the back, if you haven't done so as you entered or, or if you exit today, uh, do so. Uh, I'll ask the uh, children if they would like to uh, dismiss to the back as well for a great time of uh, fun and learning with our uh, children's message. Uh, Justina Scott's over in the nursery today, and we've opened that back up in the last couple of months. And Michelle, is um, your hand. you got another note, Michelle? Justina is oh. not able to come. Um, Aaron fell on the way getting ready and has a big goose egg, and they're taking care of him right now. So I will take the nursery kids, too. So all right. they're all with me today. Wow. <laughs> pray for Michelle. So That's if anyone sure. has little ones, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> and levon has gone for a couple weeks because of being in Florida. Well, let me, let me, uh, let's pray uh, for our children and our time together as well this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you uh, that you brought uh, such great young ones into our church and the families that have brought them here today. Lord, I just uh, pray a hedge of protection upon their lives, and we pray uh, that they would just have a, a great time of learning your ways and seeing your love and, and uh, grace expressed through scriptures and, and their lessons and some games today. Uh, pray for Michelle. We thank you for her service uh, to her many ministries in, in the church through the preschool and, and uh, through the youth ministries on Sundays and Wednesdays and, and other times. So uh, enrich her, give her the energy uh, to keep up with these little little guys and, uh, and just uh, again bless their time together. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. I wish I had that energy today. You, I noticed the first service, I just had no infliction in voice up and down, and uh, I'm going to try to stick to some notes, and, and it may be a little short today, so it probably doesn't bother you. 
Our, uh, our text today, our, our scripture reading, we're going to be looking at uh, actually Acts 6 uh, through the beginning of chapter 8 um, is where we'll be, but our selected scripture to start is going to be Acts chapter 7 and verses 52 and into the first couple verses of chapter 8. And then I will be reading uh, from the NIV version today, um, the same as your pew Bible if you desire to follow along or we uh, have it on screen as well. So Acts 7 and 52, and my, uh, mine is labeled the stoning of Steve. It may be not a joyful thought in, in the context of uh, looking at uplifting scripture, and I'll come back uh, when I begin preaching to talk more about uh, introducing this topic. But here's where we're at. Stephen speaking here before the Sanhedrin and others. He says in verse 52 of chapter 7, Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth to him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. God bless the reading of his word this morning. Okay, will you join me as we ask a blessing on Colin this morning? Lord, Heavenly Father, we just lift up Colin before you this morning. We thank you for his willingness to serve this morning. Lord, we just ask that you fill him with your Holy Spirit this morning as he brings your message, Lord, just give him the words and bless us as we hear those words this morning and may everything he does this morning be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Don, for that. And, uh, yes, Lord willing, we'll have the energy and fluids to get through the morning. So the uh, title of our lesson today bulletin is seeds in the wind it's really kind of been a synopsis of, of the last week or two of uh, referring to how the church is spread how the good news of the gospel is being spread and, and, and we're continuing in our e100 series and last week pastor mark uh, uh, when he asked me to, to speak here a couple weeks ago we were really going to speak about philip and his witness to the ethiopian unit but it, unit but it fit in so well last week with our baptisms that we had that we elected to uh, jump ahead um, uh, from the chapters that we're in today. So we're actually going to back up and talk about, uh, as last week we talked about Philip, a fellow uh, apostle with Stephen. Today we're talking about Stephen. But they both had a great place in the ministry and, and the spread of the word. And our key idea with that today is that sometimes, and I want you to keep this in mind, and I'll really close with it, sometimes religion keeps us from hearing what God is saying. Religion keeps us from hearing what God is saying. And have you, thinking about uh, the layout of today's topic, brings to my mind uh, people who have had an impact in my life. So I ask you a question of, have you ever met someone before in just a brief passing by, um, very short passing, maybe on a vacation, maybe in a brief business interaction, um, sit down at a restaurant, maybe it's just through a mutual acquaintance that uh, you have to be standing next to somebody. Maybe it was just passing by at the fuel pump down near Casey's, you know, somebody else fueling up at the same time with you, um, or at the grocery store, or at their parts counter, at the, at, the, at the parts store, or wherever it is. But you met them, and they had a very profound impact on you for just a very short moment. Whether it was something that they said, or more likely maybe in the manner that they said it, right? They were, you could tell they were just very genuine, they cared about you, they were real. 
right? And I probably bring up a great memory for you in, in that regards. Or maybe it was even, maybe it's a bit longer relationship, but a very short one that, that's a little longer, just a passing, a former coworker, manager, a boss. Um, maybe it's a neighbor that you've lived next to for a year or two, uh, a teacher, you know, that you had for a short period, a professor, some mentor in your life, uh, a family of a former friend that you knew. And the reason why it might bring up the memory, and, and I do this from time to time, I, I think, wow, that's intriguing. Where did I hear about that before? Or who taught me that? And it probably brings up a great memory, and these people uh, occasionally come to mind because of the impact they had on you. Or maybe you saw their doppelganger, right? You saw their twin. You think, who was that? You know, and, and, and you start to think about uh, who that is. That sweet, genuine, or maybe even very ornery soul comes to mind, right? Uh, but then the next time you think about them or you inquire of them through your mutual acquaintance or you read about them in the paper, they're gone. Right? And you think, man, I, I kind of wanted to catch back up with that person. Or then it brings up, what did you learn from them? What was their impact? But it was just you know, such a short uh, time in your life that, that maybe you even hope to, to reacquaint with them at some time. But they're gone. They're deceased. They're, they're passed on. You have no more opportunity to connect or, or to learn more from them, at least on this side of the earth. Um, and I had one of those experiences just recently, actually. I had um, a couple that I used to work for in some of my college years on their farm. Uh, Paul and Nancy Ackley were their name. And every Christmas, since we've been married and started having children, I would send them a Christmas card and a family photo. Um, it wasn't a couple that I really called hardly ever and, and stayed in touch with. But um, at Christmas, we'd, I'd do that. And then they'd write back, you know, something you don't get ever anymore, a handwritten letter, and, and it was really special. Uh, they tell me what was going on in their family and their lives, but they had an impact on me just uh, through the work interaction we had on the farm and learning, learning work disciplines and kind of the focuses that, that they had in life. But this year when we sent that letter, and it was just a matter of maybe five days before Christmas I'd sent it, I think they, they probably got it the day after Christmas, and I got a letter back about a week later, and it had said that uh, Nancy had, had just died, just passed away. She had a, um, some cancer-related type illness that came on pretty quick. And anyway, they got, she got the letter. She got the family photo that morning, and that afternoon is when she passed. Unexpectedly, they were actually on their way to, to Omaha for some further treatment, diagnosis of some type. And she just gone to sleep. A tumor had, had done some pressure on something, and she passed. And so I appreciate Paul writing that letter back to me. But you know, brings back those memories of, of somebody who's a friend. And why I mention that to you, and to start thinking about that, is today's lesson is from Stephen, and Stephen is a man that we meet in Acts chapter six, and two chapters later, less than two chapters within that context, he's gone. He's he's removed. And so I read about. He, at the end of his life, the stoning of him. But this is the way it is with one of our apostles from our scriptures today. When we study scripture, I often try to look at where am I in the story? What's the lesson for me, right? And so I can either be Stephen in the story or I can be part of, of the Sadducees, the religious rulers, the, the, uh, the culture, uh, part of the world of the day. And so Stephen, we'll first meet this man in chapter 6. And as I said, two chapters later, he's gone. His life is snuffed very short. And so let me describe this man to you and his role uh, in Scripture and in, in the ministry and maybe in our life. And I'm going to start reading about him again in, uh, in chapter 6 of Acts, in verses 8 um, to about 15. So this is labeled, Stephen is seized. Now Stephen, and, and when I read this, hear who Stephen is in this regard. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. 
So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They, pro they produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen is described here as a man full of grace and of wisdom and of power. He's spirit-filled. He, uh, he's wise, and he has the face of an angel it left off with, or some versions will say the face like an angel. It's, it's almost like the first time you met your spouse, right? You're not going to get that image out of your mind. You're consumed. He had the face of an angel, something that shined was something different. So I mentioned that person just that you met just briefly. It was something about them that really spoke into you. It's like the first time my wife met me. <laughs> she said, honestly, she said she was intrigued. In, intrigued, okay? She's not sure why she was intrigued, but anyway. And, and likewise, I couldn't get the, the image of, of her out of my mind, right? You're, you're consumed, but... Um, that's who Stephen is. You can just see the glow and the consumption that he has of, and the fire and the zeal he has for the Lord. He is committed. Um, and this is not something that uh, the culture, we'll refer to them as the Sadducees, he's sitting in the Sanhedrin, the religious court of the day, wants to hear, right? They've kind of, if, if we read, I'm not going to read chapter 7 much, but he gives a speech to them about all of the discourse if you want to understand the old testament without reading all of it there is a great synopsis very quickly about all of the heritage of the israelites in chapter 7 and this is who he's speaking to those who are following the old testament law and still waiting on their savior their messiah because they didn't want to see it in jesus right and we had actually just learned about and studied about and we live our life of following uh, his saving grace and his saving mercy those religious leaders had him on basically trial he's not viewing this as a trial he's just explaining to them what life is and Jesus says, but he tells them all the things that they're doing and, uh, and what they're supposedly following in the Old Testament fathers in the Old Testament ways, and he said, you've already rejected them. You didn't even believe them when they were leading you to follow the Lord, leading you to understanding that something greater would come than the law, something more greater come than your set practices, something greater than the religious ways of, of achievement uh, would be there. So let me back up a little bit and explain to you why Stephen is even mentioned here. Why do we come to the point where he is before the Sanhedrin, before the culture of the day, having the opportunity to give this speech or this sermon that we might look at. So in chapter 6, in the beginning, actually I'm going to go to uh, chapter 5, verse 41 here. And it said, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. And in chapter 6, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Piconor, Timon, Hermeneus and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to, to Judaism. They present, presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests 
became obedient to the faith. We meet Stephen along with Philip, whom we spoke of last week, being chosen as one of the seven, it's labeled here, and what we today would call deacons, kind of overseers of the church. And Stephen is a man that steps in because of a need that's in the church. The widows were being overlooked in their daily needs. The ministry of the church was growing like wildfire. And so they were all about that, spreading the good news. But they also had in the church other things we tend to about the care of people, right? And so one of the things that was brought before them was that in the distribution of food and needs, the widows were being overlooked. And if we were to read the context of, of what deacons and, and church overseers and trustees are called to do, that's one of the responsibilities uh, to look after them, just as the uh, Lord would be a father to them as well and a provider. Stephen is a great man. He's a believer uh, in this regard. And as the church grows, and in the culture of the day, and we should look at it this way as well, the church was not just one group locally. The church was a body of believers worldwide. And it was growing and it was expanding. And the distance between those places uh, was causing, obviously, as well, time needs and constraints of travel and other things like that. But there was this need that the widows were not being taken care of. He steps in um, and fulfills that. And thankfully, he and Philip and others that we read about, they take that mission to heart of spreading the good news and preaching and going forth. You know, if we looked at last week when we looked at Philip, um, truly he kind of established the first African church in the world. When he shared with, took time to share with the Ethiopian eunuch who was struggling to understand what scripture means, especially when it referred to baptism, and, and the requirements of understanding that belief goes first and then we are baptized in the water, He's, he, uh, that eunuch obviously went back home, you know, to Africa. What happened there? He grew a church with his newfound belief and understanding of the New Testament ways and of, of the good news of Jesus. When we read on, we'll spend many, many weeks studying about the life of Paul, who here we just first get introduced to as Saul, a very, very nasty, ugly individual, right, who oversaw the stoning of Stephen, who persecuted Christians beyond belief. We'll read about his, his conversion story of becoming Paul later on. And Paul established basically all the church growth and all throughout southern Europe, right, and into the Mediterranean and all his travels and his ministry and his development of, of disciples and teachers. And, you know, every letter after Acts is, is a church that, that, that Paul is writing to that he helped establish or he helped encourage, whether it's the church in Rome or Colossia or Philippi or Ephesus or Corinth. All of those were very, very significant church groups of the day. Why were they encouraged and why were they established and grown? Because Stephen here is taking a very animate stand about sharing truth, the good news. He didn't cower down from that opportunity. He didn't know who Saul was. He didn't know that's who would ultimately uh, do, do great church growth in the world, but he took his small piece of the importance that God called him to do, and, and, and he did it. And so I want to examine today really a little bit of who are we as in, are we like, are, are we called to be a Stephen? And then also I want to look at what is our role if we're sitting on in, in the Sadducees, if we're sitting in the culture, if we're part of the world as we are um, today. So what does Stephen's life and his death mean for us as Christians today? What can we take from it? A man who, who receives, again, as I said, mentioned just in chapter 6 and then dies within two chapters later, he has a great impact on us today. He truly does. Stephen shows us a few things. First, Stephen shows us that we can have a powerful impact for the kingdom, if it's even only for a short time, right? We never know which conversation may be critical in someone's life. We never know when we have that opportunity to share the joy, the peace, the truth in our life with someone else. Stephen was given a phenomenal platform. You may not have that platform, obviously, but I want you to take every little care and every individual as somebody important in life um, to share with. Secondly, no matter where we come from, I think Stephen shows us this, that God can use our past to shape our testimony 
and I'm a witness. Two of what Stephen's doing is just sharing what he believes. He's sharing his testimony. He's, he's being a witness um, for the Lord here. In his past, he connects with the audience. He connects with the Sadducees and gives them an understanding. He gives them more of a diatribe probably and an understanding of, of their forefathers and the mistakes that were made there and not following them and reminding them or showing them really how they, they persecuted and, and destroyed every prophet that came before them in the Old Testament as well, thousands of years before um, that was done. Chapter 7 uh, begins this way in the first couple verses in Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin. He said, Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? So he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham in the Mesopotamia. He goes on through many, many, many uh, prophets and forefathers before, talking about Abraham and Jacob and their movement uh, from Egypt and, and the promised lands and everything else. He gets into verse 39. He says, but our fathers refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him. They turned their hearts back to Egypt. He gives several examples of failed means of, of religion. Most importantly, one of the third things that Stephen teaches us is he shows us the cost of faith. Maybe you don't look at it as dramatically as the opportunity to take a stoning, right? Physically or, or maybe verbally um, as a thing. But Stephen does show us the cost of faith. Whether we live in a country that's full of a lot of religious freedoms, as we believe we do in America, or it's, it's more in a restricted area um, of the world, which, which exists all over. There are teens of countries uh, where, where Christians are persecuted or, you know, the underground church that has to exist in, in China and Vietnam and Korea as in other places, right? I think there's, there's some 260 million people, Christians in the world, it's estimated, that have to live in a manner where they are persecuted or or they unfortunately hide their faith in order to, to survive either life or imprisonment or, or other ways of, of persecution. And so we may find ourselves sometimes in those situations where we, I know we do, have that choice to renounce our faith, right? To subdue um, a little bit of, of our life or our message, or maybe even to die for it in a way. Um, and so through Stephen's example here, I think we can learn to, to learn to speak boldly, I hope, for our faith. And know that our lives here on earth can't compare to the joys that we'll experience in heaven. That's what Stephen looked forward to. I mean, he unfortunately was persecuted to a point that, that they ran him out. They, the Sadducees had their ears closed um, to, to what he had to say. But man, I think the way Stephen looked at it is that man can only kill my body. It can't kill my soul. It can't take that away from me. So God gave Stephen this, this great message for the religious leaders, and he gives it to us today. But tragically, they weren't the least bit interested in here. Scripture even said that they had their ears closed. They were too angry. They were too angry about what was going on with the growth of the church and somebody speaking truths that, that didn't... Uh, um, interacted, coincide with, with what they had planned and being able to uh, control uh, the world and the culture. And also, they loved their religion more than they loved God. It says that in uh, chapter 6 and 13 and 14. It, here's how it says it that way. It says, they produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Oh no, we can't. We can't uh, change uh, the Old Testament ways. We can't change our law, our religious means. Uh, we can't change that. We don't want that change. There's nothing wrong, really, with appreciating uh, your church and some of the the structure that exists here and its traditions. Some of those are great things, but sometimes also we. We're very fortunate, I think, and I'm blessed to have uh, you at Living Hope that are a little more open-minded to following scriptural ways and, and being flexible to the needs of people that maybe some denominational structures that can exist, right? Practices that, that distract us from true relationship versus religion uh, sometimes um, in those regards. But we do have to watch out to find out what's more important to us. Is it is it 
church gathering, church structure, or is it relationship and, and people and needs there? Um, is it for you, is it more than a Sunday morning? Is it more than saying, this is a discipline that I have in my life, which is a good thing, but is that the focus? Being here or being here? You know, filling a pew versus having your heart, soul, and body participate and responding with it. Or the other part of the story is outside Stephen as well, looking at Sadducees. Um, I asked my, the question to myself, um, am I too angry or frustrated with God to hear and, and, and allow some response to him sometimes? That's what the Sadducees were. They were, they were closed, right? They were angry. Is there something hidden in, in your life, hidden in your soul that, that you have um, a disgruntlement with the Lord about? Have you not gotten your way? Has he not given you something? Uh, that you saw it. or or simply to just not understand some things and I know there's many things um, about God and his ways and, and, and the reasons why he just died or many questions that the world has about uh, why why crisis happened why does tragedy come upon me you know those things like that but uh, is there some frustration that's keeping you your heart closed your ears closed like the Sadducees um, so what what about those things what what do we need to learn and to hear uh, from those of it as well? Um, the last time that uh, I had the TV on was last Sunday night. We watched a family movie together. And it seems like I don't watch much, but, but I took a lesson from it. It was a Christian movie um, called The Overcomer. And it, it's uh, the Hendrix brothers are who produced it, right? They're the ones that make the war room and... There's several others that they, they started. They were based out of an Atlantic church that, that got into producing movies and, and very well done. And, and so these Hendrick brothers put this movie together called um, The Overcomer. And I'll give you a background. I've actually got a little clip here I want to use from it uh, to, to tie in with our lesson today. But, but Coach uh, Harrison is a basketball coach uh, in, this, in this town. And he um, basically basketball was life for him. Um, and he has a senior son who's, who's pretty passionate about the fact that he'll get to college through basketball. But, but he loses his team. The, the, the town loses a factory, and about two-thirds of the students are, end up gone when the school starts. And he's not going to have a basketball team. Teachers are missing, coaches. And the superintendent asks him to step in and be a uh, cross-country coach. And he absolutely has no desire to do this whatsoever. That's not who he is. right? And uh, what we'll find is that actually cross-country team is a team of one. One girl uh, goes out for cross-country. But anyway, his life is falling apart. He's, he's, he doesn't know what's going on. He, he's having a real, real struggle. And what we're going to see in a, in a video clip is, is Coach Harrison is in the hospital. He's going to visit with somebody. He, he happens to actually backstep into the wrong room. And he meets a man by the name of Thomas Hill. And Thomas Hill and, and Coach Harrison have a brief interaction um, and uh, get to know each other um, through this, this seldom uh, occurrence. So listen uh, to this little clip here. And I want you to, we're going to talk about who you are. So, if I ask you, Thomas is blind, who you are. What's the first thing that comes to mind? I'm a basketball coach. And if that's stripped away? Well, I'm also a history teacher. Okay. We take that away. Who are you? Well, I'm a husband. I'm a father. And God forbid that should ever change. But if it does, who are you? I don't understand this game. It's not a game, man. Who are you? Um, I'm a white American male. <laughs> yeah, well, that's for sure. <laughs> Is there anything else? Well, I'm a Christian. And what's that mean? It means follower of Christ. And how important is that? It's very important. Interesting. All right, so far down your list. Okay, wait a minute. I could have easily said Christian first. Hey, yeah, but you didn't. Look, John. Your identity. 
will be tied to whatever you give your heart to. Doesn't sound like the Lord asked for his place. You're calling me a bad Christian? Let me be a little direct. Last time you were here, you said you'd pray for me. Did you? No. No. To someone who knows the Lord, you act like somebody who doesn't, which makes me wonder. What have you allowed to define you? When you lost your team, it didn't just disappoint you, it devastated you. Something or someone will have first place in your heart. But when you find your identity in the one who created you, It'll change your whole perspective. Uh, Coach Harrison had actually come to a hospital to be an encouragement to somebody else. And he finds this meeting here uh, with Thomas Hill, who's in the hospital. He's, he's blind uh, because of his past. He's had given his life to drugs and to other concerns, and it's, it's eaten him up, it's, it's consumed him, and it's, it's going to destroy him. Um, he didn't know he would be the one that would receive the lesson uh, as a witness today. Um, but, but fortunately, this Thomas knows the Lord, he's taken this opportunity to share it in, in a very unexpected way. But he said in there, your identity will be tied to what you give your heart to. You caught that. And what's interesting is it took, he said, why does it take so many layers or something like that? You know, pull back to find out who you really are here. And coach responded that, that he was a coach. Um, Thomas knew that he's just, he was just barely skimming the surface of it, right? And like Stephen, what Thomas was getting at is find out who you are. Stephen was committed. He knew his calling, and he stood for it, thankfully. The coach wasn't who John really thought he was. John was more than that. And as Thomas and John began to strip back several layers, John discovers a very ugly truth about himself, and we probably can about ourselves as well. He wasn't living out who he truly was at his core. And John and Thomas went through those many layers of the fact that he was a basketball coach, right? That's what he was passionate about. And some of us have, may have an occupation, that that's really, you know, part of things that consume you. You're very passionate. It's a, it's a calling. And, and some occupations take a lot of dedication, you know, nearly 24-7. You can't get it out of your mind, unfortunately. Um, I think about, like, in, in, in part of my occupation as a farmer, you know, if you're a livestock caretaker, or if you're a parent, you know, the children, they're always a responsibility of yours, right? You're always thinking about that and then taking the best care and looking out for them and so forth. But he was a basketball coach. He said, no, who are you? I'm a history teacher. Who are you? I'm a husband. I'm a father. But he kept saying, well, what if that's taken away from you? You know, what if your job, he, he lost the basketball team, so he knew he was no longer that. What about a history teacher? What if you lose your job? What about being a spouse? What if you lose your spouse? Or some other instance occurs where that's gone. What's left? Well, I'm a father. Well, what if your children are taken away from you by either too short of a life or other means? What's, what's left? Who are you? He finally gets to the point, well, I'm a Christian. Well, what does that mean to you? Well, it means I'm a follower of Christ. Well, and, and what does that mean? What are those actions? What's, what's, what's there? And so it really makes him ponder that point of, of who am I? Stephen knows who he is here. He gives us a wonderful, wonderful testimony to us and to the others of the culture of the day. And so when it was all stripped away, John believed that he would still be a Christian. 
uh, thankfully. And then Thomas really smacked him upside the head in, in that next question when he said, why did it take so many titles uh, to get you the title of being a Christian? Was John really living out um, the Christian life there? So do you truly know who you are when it's all stripped away in these ways? It's easy to say that, that you know, I'm a team leader at work and, and I'm the vice president of sales at the King Distributing or, you know, I own my own company. And I'm the father of, uh, you know, six wonderful children or whatever that is. And, and uh, I'm the brother of so-and-so. Um, but those are just titles. If, if those titles are stripped away, who would you be? Think about this. Get to the root of who you are in life or who you should be. You need to know this in order to stay, to stay grounded um, pretty well. And then that comment that, uh, that was made, the fact that your identity will be tied to whatever you give your heart to. This quote, follow Thomas and John's talk. And, and Thomas realized that after all the junk that he'd been through uh, in life, being a drug addict and leaving his family behind, getting his girlfriend hooked on uh, drugs as well, that this is what's important, learning about who I am. You come to Christ sometime in his past, obviously. You can tell who you are by what you give your heart to. Stephen gave it all. He gave his, his heart, uh, not planning to necessarily give life that day, but the point is, I want you to look at what Steve and how he went, not necessarily the means by which he died, but the manner of his attitude when he died. He died with great joy, right? Scripture says, and I often give this as, as what happened in my life, that when you commit yourself to the Lord, you get the peace that passes all understanding, and you will be guarded. The Lord will guard your heart and mind, Jesus Christ, in um, those words. There's a peace that the world can't take away. And uh, even though Thomas in the movie um, had, had really lost it all, right? He's laying there on his, his deathbed. He looks like he's got great joy. He had, he had joy. It was still left in him. So my question today really is, what are you giving your heart to? Are you giving it to the right things? And there's a lot of things to give it to. Um... And then also we want to learn the fact that Jesus really didn't come to start a religion. He came to start a relationship. I don't think we can say that statement enough. He didn't come to start a religion. He didn't come to start Living Hope Bible Church, a, a place, a building. He came to start a relationship with each and every one of us. And that's what we go with um, every day. He, he came to do that with, with you. So accept him. Be able to live in the peace that Stephen did. Be able to leave and live in the peace that, uh, that Thomas had and, and, and to die in a, in a spiritual state. Live and die in that spiritual state. Not that we know in, in America we're going to go down like he did, but one with a lot of peace and a lot of assurance in life. One that leaves a legacy, a heritage of obedience and faith and knowledge of a home going. Sometimes we never know. I, I always reflect on that thought that life is such a vapor. You know, whether you're in your senior years or whether you're in your prime, some may think we are. Life fades every day. Um, the, it's just the, the, the weights of the world do it. Aging um, it happens. Also, tragedies, tragedies happen uh, very significantly. We never know the day or hour when on this life, uh, on this side of the earth, is going to be snuffed out. So there is a peace that's available, though, that, that nobody can steal. And so whether you're stoned physically or emotionally like Stephen uh, was, whether you're in prison like Paul uh, will be, whether you're others, we bring Stephen to mind because he's really the first Christian martyr. That's his infamous uh, piece of it um, uh, today. But whether we're beaten and scorned, we're like Jesus in some regards. Whether we're, one of the last times I preached back in the spring, we were talking about Joseph. Whether we're abandoned, and sold, you know, forgotten, like Joseph. He never gave up faith. He never gave up hope. Some people have lost everything. Don't give up. Don't give in. Um, to close, I want to read from a great excerpt of uh, The Purpose Driven Life, a study by Rick Warren. And talking about who am I? What, what's at the core? What's at the root of, of my life? And, and so the study has been one that had a great impact on my life back in probably collegiate years. But speaking of life and, 
and the mission uh, that we're really made out for. In John 17, 18, uh, the scripture says, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world, Jesus said. Acts 20 and 24 says, the most important thing that I can is that I complete my mission, the work that God, the Lord Jesus, gave me. So here's some context from uh, Rick Warren uh, speaking about, really I'll take it today, as how Stephen, he emulated the life of Jesus, right, that we're, we're called to do as well. And here's the commitment um, that we see. So Rick says, Jesus clearly understood his life mission on earth. At age 12, he said, I must be about my father's business. And 21 years later, dying on the cross, he said, it is finished. Like bookends, these two statements frame a well-lived, purpose-driven life. Jesus committed the mission the Father gave him. The mission Jesus had while on earth is now our mission because we are the body of Christ. What he did in his physical body, we are to continue as his spiritual body, the church. What is that mission? Introducing people to God. The Bible says Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. God wants to redeem human beings from Satan and reconcile them to himself so we can fulfill the five purposes he created us for him. Number one, to love him, to be a part of his family, to become like him, to serve him, and to tell others about him. Once we are his, God uses us to reach others. He saves us and then sends us out. The Bible says we have been sent to speak for Christ. We are the messengers of God's love and purposes to the world. Telling others about how they can have an eternal life is the greatest thing you can really do for them. Whether it's, it's that brief passing by of an impact you can have, and sometimes we don't really realize that impact until later. Right? Um, you know, the, the analogy would be that if you had a neighbor who's struggling with something, a, a terrible addiction or, or a challenge or a question in their mind or uh, had cancer, you knew you had the cure for them, it'd be criminal to withhold it from them, right? Something that, that could save their very physical life, but we have something that can save their soul. So even worse is to keep secret the way to forgiveness, to purpose, to peace, to eternal life. We have that greatest news in the world. The, the news and the sharing is the greatest kindness that we can ever show anyone. Rick uh, leaves it as well in this way. He says, one problem long-term Christians have is that they forget how hopeless it is to feel to be without Christ. We must remember that no matter how contented or successful people appear to be, Without Christ, they are hopelessly lost and headed for eternal separation from God. The Bible says Jesus is the only one who can save people. Everybody needs Jesus. And so our mission has eternal significance. It will impact the eternal destiny of other people in so many ways. And nothing else you ever do will ever matter as much as helping people establish an eternal relationship with God. Kind of our message for today, I think, is to model, Stephen, to model what we learned about last week and fill up that little opportunities. These were significant ones, but we have little opportunities to share our faith in, in so many ways. So we'll close with that today and leave you with that. Am I prepared for those opportunities? Do first of all, I understand that relationship and we'll bring the band up and we'll ready for our Time of invitation, but, the, but there's always that opportunity. The Lord says, here's what I have for you today. Here's, here's the neighbor that, that needs help. Here's a stranger you're going to pass by that knows it. And if you don't have that assurance and understanding yourself, look into that today. Oh, always. Take up the assurance and the peace that only the Lord Jesus can provide us. Our altar is always open to the Lord in, in your time here of our invitation him.
today. We do look upon your face as something uh, full of knowledge and grace, and I ask that uh, for our congregation to, today that uh, you fill us uh, with purpose and with meaning. Give us the commitment uh, that we learn about and observe in Stephen and, uh, and the other apostles, Lord, those that were fire, fire had, a, had a continuous zeal to speak the truth and to show it. In the line. Help us as well, God, to just take away uh, the blinders from our eyes that, that the culture of, of the day had, and even of today, uh, we can have as well. Open our ears continuously to the needs about us in our community as you send us out today. Um, reveal to us your ways, your mission, your calling for our life. Help us to understand who we are. Help us to push aside um, our, our so-called religious um, feelings and, and uh, disciplines and, and to really understand and to show that you are what matters, the relationship, the consuming fire and zeal we ought to have for you. But that's where true peace and true joy comes from, only found in you, Jesus, and the salvation, the forgiveness and peace you offer us. So send us out today, Lord, uh, with your grace and mercy. I pray this for us all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We have some announcements. Don? Okay. Well, I can turn the page. Okay. Wednesday this week is the Children's Ministries, uh, Jam, Blast, and CIA, all with a meal beforehand. Um, this coming Saturday at 8 a.m. is Deacon's Meeting. Um, also, um, there's a church work day scheduled for Saturday, April 24th at 9 a.m. Remember that. And uh, I think that's all I have today. And thank you, Colin, for sharing with us this morning. It was very good. I'm tempted. <laughs> so, anyway, I guess we'll have our closing song. 